Welcome to the first trimester review. My name is Jen Harper and I am one of the nurse practitioners here at New England OBGYN Associates. And I'll also be referring to uh, the practice as Nioga. Here I have uh, pictured our, our eight OB uh, physicians at Nioga. And for the care of your pregnancy in our office, you will have one primary OB physician who will be caring for you. And towards the middle and the end of the pregnancy, you'll have rotating visits with the other OB physicians in the practice. This will allow you to have a chance to meet all of the other physicians. The Neoga physicians rotate being on call at the hospital and seeing patients in here in the office. So if you should spontaneously go into labor, for example, if your water broke or you started to have contra irregular contractions, it would be the doctor that was on call at the hospital that would likely deliver you. If you needed a planned cesarean section or an induction, this could always be scheduled with your primary OB physician. So hopefully everybody is already and has been taking a prenatal vitamin, but I'm just going to review prenatal prenatal vitamins that we recommend. Any over-the-counter prenatal vitamin is appropriate as long as it has, you know, the 800 micrograms of folic acid, the 27 milligrams of iron, and 200 to 300 milligrams of DHA. If you are having twins or multiples and there are additional requirements of these three uh, nutrients, we also encourage getting uh, daily vitamin D and calcium from food sources uh, to make up for the requirements of the vitamin D and uh, uh, calcium, which I have listed here. Your prenatal vitamin may have some vitamin D and calcium in it already. If it does and you feel like you are getting enough through diet sources, you do not need to take additional uh, supplement. If you have a vitamin D deficiency already, and are already taking an additional supplement. This is very common living here in the Northeast. Um, you just wanna make sure that you're not taking any more than uh, 2,000 international units a day. And um, as we recommended that everybody should take some DHA, which is found uh, in um, uh, fish sources. Uh, if you're not eating a lot of fish, um, additional sources of DHA can come in like egg, fortified eggs with omega-3 and ground flaxseed. In the next couple, in the next few slides, I'll just list some uh, sources uh, of food that contain certain nutrients. So here is a list of calcium, list sources of calcium. And here we have sources of vitamin D. And here are good sources of iron. Usually with a, a pregnancy, women are pretty familiar with the things they cannot eat and the restrictions that are imposed during pregnancy. Um, but so I'm going to talk about diet recommendations. Uh, so the first thing is that you do increase your calorie requirements when you're pregnant, pregnant. Um, and I have it listed here, uh, for typically for a single pregnancy, the requirements increase to 340 additional calories in the second trimester and 450 additional calories in the third trimester. You don't need to start calorie counting per se, but it is helpful to know you need a little bit more uh, to help with the growing pregnancy. The best thing to do is just concentrate on getting whole, food, whole foods and healthy proteins in your diet. As for the restriction recommendation, it is recommended to reduce your risk for infections. 
we will review some of the restrictions I have listed on the slide. So you want to make sure to cook all of your meats, poultry and fish thoroughly because undercooked meat or seafood um, has the risk of contamination with coliform, bacteria, toxoplasma, or salmonella. You want to make sure all your fruits and vegetable, vegetables are washed thoroughly before you eat or cook them. Soil that they were grown in could be contaminated with toxoplasma. You want to try to avoid all unpasteurized dairy products and juices as unpasteurized products may contain a bacteria called Listeria. And uh, you want to avoid all unpasteurized soft cheeses like brie, feta, camembert, blue, blue veined and Mexican style cheeses. Pasteurized soft cheeses are okay. So if you were to go to the grocery store and uh, the label on the block of cheese, uh, say feta, says it was made with pasteurized milk or cream, then it is okay. Hard cheeses, processed cheeses, cream cheeses, and yogurts are all safe. You want to avoid all raw, uh, raw eggs or food made with raw eggs. Raw eggs or any food containing raw eggs should be avoided because of the potential risk of salmonella. Some Caesar salad dressings, homemade aiolis, homemade ice cream and custards, and hollandaise, hollandaise sauces may be made with raw eggs. We also advise that you do not consume deli meats, smoked meats, or smoked seafoods, as some of these meats um, uh, can carry the risk of having a bacteria. Um, smoking is a form of cooking in which uh, it is cooked a low temperature for a long period of time, but not high enough temperature to kill certain bacteria, like Listeria. However, if you had something like a pizza or a casserole, like a buffalo chicken pizza that had blue cheese in it, or a Greek pizza that had feta, or a wine pizza that had smoke, ham and it was being heated thoroughly in an oven, it should be high enough to kill any bacteria. Nuts, peanut butter, nut butters are considered safe as long as you don't have a personal allergy to them. It has not been shown that peanut butter, nut or nut butters consumed during the pregnancy to uh, be linked to peanut nut allergies in children. We do advise limiting sugar substitutes. This would include things like your NutraSweet, saccharin, aspartame, stevia. There's just not a lot of studies on uh, these sugar substitutes. So we recommend just, you know, limiting once a day if you decided that you wanted to have like a, a diet soda for your treat, just, you know, once a day. And, you know, obviously there are better things to drink than that. And water is a great, uh, you know, fluid source. So just be uh, wary of that. Eating fish is recommended during the pregnancy. However, because fish contain mercury and the bigger fish eat the smaller fish and the mercury accumulates, it is recommended that uh, you don't consume too much. So the recommendation is about 12 ounces a week in two to three portions. Um, you can eat things like shrimp, crab, clams, oysters, scallops, canned light tuna or salmon, pollock, catfish, cod or the white fishes are pretty uh, good sources of, of these, these smaller fish. You can have six ounce portion of the medium fish per week. So once a week, if you wanted to have, uh, things like a tuna steak, just be wary that tuna steak should be cooked thoroughly. So it's not pink. Canned albacore. This is the bigger tuna, um, or chunk white tuna. You just want to avoid the larger fish such as swordfish, tilefish, king mackerel, and shark. And as for caffeine, it is safe uh, to take in um, 300 milligrams or less of uh, caffeine equivalent. This would be equivalent to uh, one to two small cups of coffee during the day. Just remember, it's really important to try to drink a lot of water during your pregnancy. Um, it can help cure a lot of ailments. Um, sipping water uh, throughout the day tends to be helpful. I usually recommend if you're able to, to, you know, get a new water bottle, new fancy, pretty water bottle and just make that your pregnancy water bottle and then, uh, make sure you drink lots of fluids. 
this slide just reviews the weight gain in pregnancy. Um, so most people will gain between, the recommendation will be between 25 and 35 pounds. If you weigh, if your BMI, your body mass index is slightly under or over, the weight uh, recommendations may change. Um, so it's all based on your pre-pregnancy BMI. So the following slide has a chart of a body mass index table or a BMI chart. Um, you can refer to that. Most of your weight gain will, is going to be in the second and third trimesters. Some women do gain weight in the first trimester. Some women actually do lose weight, but most of the weight we're going to see is going to be in the second and third trimesters. Here is your body max index table. Exercise is uh, important during pregnancy. And it is recommended that women, pregnant women try to maintain regular, regular to moderate intensity exercise during the pregnancy. It is recommended that pregnant women try to complete about 150 minutes per week. A good breakdown would be like 30 minutes five times a week. Maintaining routine exercise can be good in preparation for labor to help keep those floor, uh, pelvic floor muscles um, and ligaments loose. Exercise is also good for blood sugar control and blood pressure control. Good forms of exercise could, would include walking, non-impact aerobic exercise such as elliptical, stationary bike, and swimming. You just want to avoid exercise that um, are uh, that you have to do flat on your back um, once you get out of the first trimester. So a lot of people will ask, like, you know, when can I do, not stop doing? When do I have to stop doing crunches? And so it's like. Once you're out of the first trimester, you just kind of want to avoid things that you are flat on the back, uh, flat on your back. You should be able to, um, in terms of like uh, aerobic exercise and how hard you should exercise, you should be able to converse comfortably during the exercise. This, um, this is kind of like the talk test, meaning you should be able to talk through the exercise. Um, if you were to become short of breath during the exercise while you're talking, um, then you probably just need to cut back on the intensity of the exercise or the du duration. If you have a regular routine that you've been doing, which includes like running, aerobic exercise prior to becoming pregnant, you can likely continue and can continue and then just monitor your, uh, how you do with the exercise and you might just need to curb it a little bit. Exercise to avoid are things uh, like contact sports or things that you could have high risk for falling, such as horseback riding, downhill skiing, water skiing, and skydiving. Don't recommend any of those. Um, and in terms of, we do encourage that you avoid hot yoga, saunas, hot tubs, and, and hot tubs. Just don't want you to be in an environment that might make it higher risk for you to um, dehydrate quickly um, uh, or slip and fall. If you do any particular exercise that you're concerned that you may want to continue but not sure if it's safe, you can review that with your provider. There are some limitations and contraindications, um, but typically they're related to problems that might occur into the pregnancy. So if you were have um, if you've had a history of a preterm delivery, then we might require that you limit some of your exercise. If you have cervical incompetence, if you have multiple gestations or twins, or if you develop pregnancy-induced hypertension, have preterm labor or bleeding during the pregnancy, we may give you some restrictions. So now we're going to talk about medications and supplements. I always review the fact that if you need a medication, um, we always look at it as less is more. So if you're using a once in a while medication to treat something and you're finding that you're using it more often, then you need to review that with us, even though we say it's safe in pregnancy. Just let us know. Um, the following medications are safe, considered safe, if used in moderation and as per prescribed. Um, and I have listed some medications that are helpful for some ailments that occur in pregnancy. So nausea is a common symptom in pregnancy and can make it 
very hard for women to do normal daily living activities. Um, typically, we recommend, um, so like first starting off with, you know, non-medication uh, treatments, including small frequent meals, avoiding drinking and eating at the same time, continuing small sips of fluids throughout the day, taking in lemon drops, ginger candy. There's also things like radial bands, C bands. These are bracelets that put pressure on the radial nerve and can sometimes be helpful. Over the counter medications that can be helpful include vitamin B6, uh, which you can take either two to three times per day with the addition of half a Unisom tab at night. There are prescription medications that include over the counter medications, um, inc include these over the counter medications. Uh, the peroxidine and the uh, doxaliamine, um, and it's it's called diclegia, so it's a prescription medication. So if you wanted to have a prescription of these medications to be taken up to four times a day, we could act, uh, accommodate that too. Some antihistamines can be helpful, such as Benadryl and Dramamine. You just need to take as directed. Over-the-counter cold medications are helpful to treat symptoms of a cold, such as a runny nose, congestion, and cough. Um, we do not recommend you take any pseudoephedrine or phenylnephrine. These are agents that help with, they're really good at helping with like congestion, um, but we do not want you to take them during the pregnancy. You can take something like Benadryl instead. Um, Tylenol is good for headaches and sore throats. Guaifenesin and Delsum are um, good at helping thin out uh, the mucus and suppressing a cough so you can sleep. These are over-the-counter medication uh, cough syrups like Robitussin and Delsum. Allergies sometimes become worse in pregnancy, so taking a daily Claritin or Zyrtec or Benadryl are fine to do. In terms of pain medications, um, the only pain medication that is considered safe in pregnancy is Tylenol, and you can use this for minor aches and pains like headache. Um, you want to avoid any ibuprofen, ibuprofen containing products and aspirin. Some women do end up taking aspirin in the pregnancy, but uh, under the guidance of their doctor. Another common ailment that can happen in pregnancy is heartburn. Um, you can treat this by first eating small frequent meals and avoiding drinking a lot while eating. Um, or you can use like a trial of Tums or Pepsid as they can be helpful. Constipation is another common ailment in pregnancy occurring because the hormones in pregnancy can slow down the gut to slow, allow for better absorption as well as the addition of the prenatal vitamin, the iron that's in the prenatal vitamin. A daily colace can be helpful. This helps to bring water into the gut so the stool is nice and soft and easier for you to pass. Um, it does not make you go, so if you have an issue with going to the bathroom, you need to, need, may need to add a stimulant, such as milk with mag uh, or Senecat. Metamucil is a fiber supplement that helps bulk up your stool. Uh, mental health medications or SSRIs um, can be used during the pregnancy and it is considered safe to do so. Uh, the benefits to continuing these medications have shown to outweigh any potential risks. In general, we recommend avoiding herbal supplements. Um, they typically are not um, well studied or, or approved by the FDA. Um, you want to consult your doctor if you're taking any specific um, uh, supplement. But teas in a, that in a tea bag form you might find at the grocery store are fine um, to continue to use. Protein shakes, supplements can be used during the pregnancy. Generally, adult women need about 46 grams of protein in a day. Pregnant and lactating women actually require 71, mil uh, 71 grams of protein in a day. And... Um, so it is recommended that women, these women add 25 grams of protein on top of what their normal needs are. So um, 
protein shakes can be really helpful uh, for people to kind of quickly get in uh, some protein. Um, other sources of protein, which I have, uh, it's also included in the side slides for iron, but, you know, lean meats, fish, eggs, beans, and nuts. So now we're going to talk about genetic screening. And I have listed um, that there are typically two genetic tests um, that are offered to pregnant women. They're offered at that first office visit that you come in and see the physician at your 10 weeks. The first one I'll review is the test that tests the baby for chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, this is a non-invasive prenatal test in which a blood draw from mom's arm is taken at 10 weeks. And at that time, there is enough circulating DNA from the placenta in mom's blood uh, to test for the presence of trisomy 21, trisomy 13, and trisomy 18, as well as any abnormal sex chromosomes. These chromosomal abnormalities are actually very rare, but babies can continue to grow within the womb and even be delivered with these conditions. Trisomy 21 is a genetic condition causing developmental and intellectual delays in, in individuals who are affected. It causes a dis causes distinct facial appearance, intellectual disability, developmental delays, and may be associated with thyroid or heart disease. Trisomy 13 and 18 are genetic conditions in which babies die within the womb or shortly after birth. These babies suffer from a combination of birth defects. This includes severe learning problems and health problems that nearly affect every organ in the body. Problems with breathing, eating, eliminating, so this specific test, this uh, first trimester screen, uh, is a screening test. Since it is a blood draw from mom, we are also seeing mother's blood. Any abnormality is attributed to the baby, as we know that mom has normal chromosomes, and should be verified with a diagnostic test. Um, so I have listed here the diagnostic tests include a cori villi sampling or amniocentesis. These two tests will look at all 23 chromosome pairs. The cori villi sampling, or CVS, is the removal of chorionic tissue. Um, it carries a slightly higher risk of pregnancy loss than the amnio, about a 2% risk of miscarriage. The amniocentesis is an ultrasound guidance uh, removal of an amniotic fluid. The fluid that is taken has skin cells from the baby which the DNA can be analyzed, and it carries about a half of a percent of risk of miscarriage. The other screening test we can offer to um, uh, our patients or partners um, is this uh, carrier screening test for certain diseases. Typically, these diseases are recessive diseases, meaning that in order for the baby to be affected, both parents must pass down similar gene mutations. It is more common to be a carrier of genetic disease than actually have the disease. If So with this test, we are testing for um, gene mutations that potentially could cause uh, a genetic disease, a recessive genetic disease. If the tests show that you carry a gene mutation um, of a certain, gen certain genetic disease, then your partner should also be tested to see if they carry or carry a similar gene mutation. If your partner does carry this similar gene mutation, there is a one quarter chance that the baby could inherit both mutations from mom and dad, um, half a chance that the baby only inherits one of the gene mutations, and a quarter of a chance that the baby does not inherit any of the gene mutations, so they inherited the normal genes. So this is a kind of a fun slide. This is just depicting um, the baby in development um, by weeks. Um, this shows embryological weeks, so it doesn't go with 40. So ideally, um, <coughs> um, at 38, this is, if we go by your last menstrual period, that would be a 40-week pregnancy. But these are fun, and you can find them in lots of apps that you can find on your smartphones. And it's kind of fun to know when the ears are growing, when the lungs are growing. 
um, that type of thing. Now I'm going to talk about exposures in pregnancy. Some of the information I have here you may already know about, but I am going to touch about each of them. Um, so tobacco. Tobacco is not good to either smoke or chew whether you're pregnant or not pregnant, but especially when you're not pregnant. There's been multiple studies that have demonstrated a clear association between maternal smoking and perinatal morbidity and mortality. Um, Placenta previa, placenta abruption, premature rupture of membranes are factors in many pregnancy losses in smokers. Alcohol use. Um, in terms of alcohol use, there's not been shown a safe limit, and therefore it is recommended that you do abstain from al all alcohol during your pregnancy. Medications. Um, you want to make sure all your medications are um, reviewed with your uh, provider. And as discussed, there are some safe over-the-counter medications that you can take but please only take medications that have been approved. Uh, for example, if you were prescribed a medication during your pregnancy, say treat an infection by your primary care, always let us know so we can document that in your chart and review that with you. We do use diagnostic imaging to evaluate the baby, and um, so uh, we ultrasounds are used um, and considered safe to do so. Um, if for whatever reason um, other parts of your body needed to be imaged, um, we can use ultrasounds. MRIs are another uh, form of uh, imaging study that we can use and using magnets to kind of evaluate. Um, we do ask that you uh, not expose yourself to x-rays um, or radiation exposing um, imaging studies like x-rays and CT scans. Um, we really need to kind of uh, review the, uh, make sure that the risk of the exposure is justified. Um, since dental x-rays are away from the abdomen, um, they're considered not harmful to the fetus. Um, um, however, um, you want to let your dentist know that you are pregnant um, so that they can double shield you and uh, block your neck as well. Um, how conservatively I would say if you don't need to have if you're not having a dental emergency like having teeth pain um, then to avoid any of the uh, dental x-rays until after you're um, delivered so anytime you go up into a plane you are exposed to radiation um, in the air um, the higher altitudes have more radiation exposure um, but not a lot um, so, but there is a limit out there, so for people who are uh, want to know, um, the National Council of Radiation Protection and Measurements recommends no more than 100 milliRMs exposure in a year for a single person. Um, this would correspond uh, to a 40-week pregnancy, so uh, and would be equivalent to seven round-trip flights from Tokyo to New York or uh, 15 trips from New York to Seattle. Now we're going to talk about concerning, concerning virus exposure. Um, I will save talking about COVID-19 for the next couple slides. Um, but we are exposed to viruses throughout our lifetime, and there are some viruses that are more concerning that, that if you would to contract them during your pregnancy. Um, so I'm going to go over these here. Um, so We'll start with CMV or cytomegalovirus. This is a virus that most adults, 50 to 85 percent, are exposed to by the time they're 40. Um, the concern is really a primary exposure that potentially could affect the fetus. This meaning that this is the first time you've ever contracted the virus and you're pregnant. Um, the pa virus passes easily through every body fluid you can imagine. Saliva, blood, urine, tears, and breast milk. Prevention is the key. And the prevention is good hand hygiene, um, making sure you're using soap and water and washing vis vigorously for 20 seconds. And you also want to not share food with uh, small children or share utensils with small children. Uh, typically, it's the small children who usually end up having or getting a cytomegalovirus um, uh, for the first time. Toxoplasmosis is a parasite that can be found in contaminated feces of cats and in contaminated raw meat. So it is recommended that if you do have a cat, 
have someone else change the kitty litter, and to not consume raw or undercooked meats. Um, so when ordering out, just ask for your meats to be cooked well done. Parvovirus, or Fifth's disease, also called slap cheek disease, um, is a virus that affects 50% of adults in the U.S. Um, it is a childhood illness, um, and children get better from it. Um, typically, it lasts for 7, 10 days, um, and prevention is by avoiding people who have it. Um, so you want to avoid persons or children with fist disease. Typically, what I find is that people might get a letter that says uh, your there has been an, uh, a case of parvovirus in your child's classroom. Um, if you're pregnant, let your OB know. So sometimes you might find that a friend tells you like, hey, you're at my house. Turns out my daughter classmate has parvovirus or something like that. Or you might end up from your friend saying like, looks like my daughter had parvovirus and you were here last weekend. Then you would just let us know um, so that the doctor can review uh, your care. So Zika virus, uh, uh, Zika virus is a mosquito borne uh, virus. Um, symptoms include low-grade fever, rash, um, aches, and conjunctivitis. Um, symptoms only occur in about 20% of patients within two, 2 to 12 days um, and has been, has been associated with congenital microcephaly and fetal losses. Um, the Center of Disease Control, CDC, uh, and Prevention uh, advise that pregnant women consider postponing travel to any areas that where Zika virus transmission is ongoing and this these areas kind of change um, so I do recommend if you're planning a trip just check the CDC make sure where you're going does not have any concerning issues for endemics uh, and then if you're traveling anywhere with um, that has mosquitoes um, uh, you want to make sure you take the protective measures and use repellents that are appropriate uh, things that have DEET, and I will supply some information regarding uh, the appropriate uh, bug repellent you should use in pregnancy. Chicken pox, rubella, these are uh, really old diseases that um, you should have been vaccinated for. We will ask you about your history of chicken pox if you've known, if you've had it, um, but we will also test in your blood to see if your body has developed an antibody for it and if, uh, from either a vaccine or an infection. So there are some viruses we will uh, review your exposure history. Uh, general herpes is a virus that presents as general, on, uh, virus that presents as um, a sores on your genitals during an outbreak. Um, you just want to let your OB know if you or your partner have ever had genital herpes. Uh, we are concerned about a risk of a possible outbreak during the time of delivery and potentially passing on to the baby. So if you do have a history, uh, we'll just give you antivirals um, during the last few weeks of your pregnancy to prevent an outbreak. Human papillomavirus, um, there are certain strains of this virus that can change the cells in your cervix and predispose a woman to cervical cancer. It's the right reason why we perform pap smears on a regular basis. Um, HPV has not demonstrated to be cause a problem during the pregnancy um, or issues with transmission um, during delivery. However, if you've tested positive HPV, you want to let us know. Um, we'll determine whether or not you need to have a pap smear at that first visit or if you'll wait till you postpartum um, and if you've ever had treatment to treat abnormal cells on your cervix like a leap procedure or a biopsy um, we may just monitor your cervical cervix a little bit more closely uh, for changes um, of softening of the cervix or shortening of the cervix So now we'll talk a little bit about COVID-19. And as you know, coronavirus disease 19 or COVID-19 is a respiratory illness that is spread from person to person. The symptoms include mild to severe respiratory illness, fever, chills, flu-like symptoms, cough, shortness of breath. It is spread to person to person via respiratory droplets in people who are in close contact to each other. A person inhales the droplet from an infected person when they are exposed to an infected person who is coughing, sneezing, or talking. 
The virus can also live on surfaces and be transmitted from someone touching a contaminated surface and then touching their mouth, nose, or eyes. We currently do not know if pregnant women have a greater chance of getting sick from COVID than the general public, nor whether they are likely to have more serious illness as a result. However, we can extrapolate our recommendations based on the information we know about other coronaviruses and the influ influenza virus. Based on the information now, which we don't have a lot of, um, pregnant women, people seem to have the same risk as adults who are not pregnant. However, we do know that a pregnant woman's bodies change and make them more susceptible for other infections. Um, pregnant people have a higher risk of severe illness when infected with viruses from the same family and as COVID-19 and other respiratory, respiratory uh, infections such as influenza. So we take extra special precautions for um, our pregnant patients. Mother to child transmission of coronavirus during pregnancy is unlikely, but after birth, a newborn is susceptible to that, to that same person person spread. A very small number of babies have been test, have tested positive for the virus shortly after birth. However, it is unknown of if these babies got the virus before or after birth. The virus has not been detected in amniotic fluid, breast milk, or other maternal samples as of yet. Um, in terms of breastfeeding, uh, if you have COVID-19, breast milk provides protection against many illnesses and is the best source of nutrition for baby, most babies. You, along with your family health care providers, should decide whether or not and how to start or continue breastfeeding if should you, you contract COVID-19. In limited studies, um, COVID-19 has not been detected in breast milk, however, we do not know what, for sure whether mothers with COVID-19 can spread the virus via breast milk. Um, if you end up having COVID-19 and you um, have delivered and deciding to breastfeed, please review with your provider the guidance regarding this. Uh, this is this can be very fluid and changing and it might change um, by the time that occurs. So the best way that we can uh, protect ourselves um, during this pandemic is what you've been hearing about uh, all along for the last month or so. Um, you want to make sure you maintain uh, social distancing and stay home unless you must go out. Um, avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands and make sure you wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. And you, oh, um, and if your hands are not dirty um, and you don't need to wash your hands or you don't have water, avail water and soap available for you, to you, then you can use an alcohol-based sanitizer uh, that contains at least 60% alcohol. Um, other things that you can do are to um, clean, disinfect frequently touched items um, and do that often and then cover your mouth and nose with a cloth uh, face cover when around others. So other exposures in pregnancies, we get a lot of questions about like what can I, you know, do in terms of like taking care of my hair and my skin. Um, so in terms of facial treatments, um, pregnancy increases the circulating hormones in your body, which can sometimes change the texture and cause acne prone skin. There are some acne medications that you are that are contraindicated in pregnancies. Um, Accutane, Retin-A and Tetracycline. Um, so you do want to avoid those. Some over-the-counter medications that you ask that we ask that you avoid conservatively. This is a conservative approach. Just things that have salicylic acid, just because it has it's in the family of aspirin, um, beta hydroxy acid, retinoids, retinols, and uh, but benzoyl peroxide is considered safe, and you can use a little spot treatment if you need to if you had some acne breakouts. 
Um, dermatologic peels that are generally considered safe um, have alpha hydroxy acid, glycolic acid, and lactic acid. Um, and just please be aware that you're uh, that during the pregnancy, um, how your skin reacts to them might be a little bit different than before. In terms of hair treatments, the chemicals used in hair salons are a lot less toxic than they used to be. However, um, conservatively, I do recommend people waiting to color their hair until the second trimester. Um, and it's best to do like highlights versus overall hair color. In terms of body hair removal, the skin has more blood flow and is usually more sensitive in pregnancy. Waxing may be a little bit more painful, but it is fine to do so. There aren't uh, any studies done to evaluate like laser hair removal or electrolysis and the effects on the fetus. Uh, we generally recommend that you avoid these in pregnancy. Um, depilatories um, and creams, things like Nair, have not been shown to be harmful. Um, they have also not been shown to be safe. They are a chemical, but if you too, do choose to use those, um, make sure you test a small area of your skin first. Um, and not to use uh, large areas uh, of this chemical creams. It's better, it's safer to just go with waxing and shaving. Paint. The overall general recommendation is uh, have someone else do the painting. So a lot of women uh, uh, or a lot of families will start to consider like painting the baby's room. So if, conservatively, I would say if somebody else can do it, just have them do it. But if you really want to be involved in the project, just avoid any oil-based paints. Limit the limit use of latex paints that have ethylene glycols or ethers and biocides. Make sure your skin is completely covered, work in a well-ventilated area, and take several breaks. Recreational patient painting is fine. You want to avoid like more, more fumy paints like oil-based paints, but Instead, use like water-based paints and acrylics. People can ex be exposed to many things, and some can be concerning in pregnancy and some are not. Um, a lot of the information that we learn are from retrospective studies, you know, studies in which we learned that someone was exposed to that before, and this is what happened to the baby, but there's no... It's unethical for us to kind of develop a study and see what would happen. Um, so lo some of the studies that we have are animal studies as well. So um, this uh, slide just gives you some information um, for a great resource that is free. Um, mother to baby. Um, also, it was formerly Pregnancy and Exposure Info Line is a service provided free of charge to clinicians and the general public that offers practical evidence-based information about exposures during the pregnancy and potential effects to the developing fetus. fetus. Um, they provide information on common daily exposures to things like hair dye, paint, herbal products, uh, to more specific exposures, including illicit drugs, medications, infections, chemicals, and many other things. Um, so it's really nice. You can call them. You can text them. I would definitely recommend visiting the website just to take a look. Um, and you can chat live with an expert. Um, a lot of women have done it um, based on like their occupational exposure. Um, the other thing I'd like to list is the Environmental Working Group that provides some uh, information and safety measures and guidance for patients regarding safe and safer products to use in the pregnancy. They actually have a mobile app called Skin Deep, which can be very helpful. Um, and helps rate the toxicity of over-the-counter topical lotions, sunscreens, and cleansers. So you can take a look at that as well. So travel in pregnancy. Um, I wrote here the best time to travel is in your pregnancy is between weeks 14 and 18. You can travel outside of those. Um, typically, I just wrote that uh, it, it's usually there's like less... Uh, the most common mer pregnancy emergencies usually happen in the first uh, and third trimester. So it's good to travel in this time when people are feeling less nauseous, have more energy. Um, and after 28 weeks, it may be harder for you to move around or sit for a long period of time. Um, during the mid, during your mid pregnancy, your energy is returned, morning sickness is gone and you were, and you are still mobile. Um, so if you're planning on traveling by car, um, 
it can be very, traveling in general can be very tiresome, but you may want to limit your travel to five or six hours a day and make sure you're wearing your, continue to wear your seatbelt below your belly, around your hip bone, and then stop every couple hours. It's likely that you're going to have to go to the bathroom anyways, um, so those stops will probably already be put into your trip. Um, and the big, like another thing I'd like to, if you're ever in a car accident, report any of your car accidents to OB, even small ones, even fender benders or, you know, like a quick uh, accident. Just let us know. If you're traveling um, by airplane, just uh, let your OB doctor know and so that they you can check in and see, make sure it's medically safe for you. Um, so if you book the trip a few months um, uh, uh, ahead of time um, at your visit just before your trip, just let your OB know that you're going on a trip. Um, if general, in general, if you're not experiencing any medical problems in your pregnancy, travel is considered safe up until 36 weeks of your pregnancy when traveling within the uh, con continental United States and up to 32 weeks when traveling outside the continental United States. I always recommend, if you can, book the aisle seat so it's easier for you to stretch your legs during a long flight. It's also easier for you to get up and, you know, walk the aisle as well. Um, avoid gas-producing foods and carbonated drinks before your flight because gas kind of expands in the low pressure um, and ca can cause you more discomfort. Again, when you're in the airplane, make sure you're wearing your seatbelt um, at all times. And when going through security, it is safe through safe to go through those metal detectors. Um, they have these new security measures uh, with backscatter X-rays, where you have to put your hands up and like something comes around you, like in a circle. Um, uh, this is emits small amounts of radiation, but you can ask to have just the pat down search and magnet wand search, um, just to reduce any risk of exposure. I have here. Um, if you're concerned about any uh, like disease exposure in other countries, um, you can go to the CDC website. It can be very helpful. The Bergamo Women's Hospital also has a travel clinic. If you had any questions about that, um, in terms of you know right now uh, during the um, COVID-19 pandemic, we're not we're you, nobody can travel, um, especially pregnant women. We don't want you traveling, but um, other reasons to kind of avoid certain areas would include uh, uh, the concern for malaria, which can be found in like Africa, Central, Central and South America and Asia. Um, also, you know, traveling into places that don't have clean water, you want to avoid uh, things like uh, so you don't get travel diarrhea. Um, just know that, you know, the 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 best the safest water to drink is boiled water. Um, Bottled water doesn't really have any uh, regulations to it, but um, and you just want to make sure in terms of if you're concerned about the water, you know, note about that when you're brushing your teeth and when you're getting ice in your drinks as well. So in terms of deep vein thrombosis, it is a condition which a blood clot forms in the veins in your legs and, in, and or in other parts of your body and can be dare, dangerous if it travels and causes a pulmonary embolism, so a clot in your lung. So um, anybody who's not moving for a long period of time, like if you're in an airplane or in a car just sitting for hours on end, um, you're at increased risk for developing a blood clot. Um, how pregnant women, because of the circulating hormones, you're at slightly more increased risk. Um, so the things that you want to do when you're sitting down for a long period of time when you're traveling is making sure you're drinking lots of fluids, fluids, wearing loose fitting clothing, walking and stretching um, at regular intervals. So whether in your car, stopping, getting up, taking a break, walking, if you're in an airplane, getting up, kind of walking down the aisle. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to wear special stockings, um, TED stockings um, that help compress uh, the legs below the knee and helps kind of bring blood flow back and forth. If you're traveling, um, Outside of the United States, there is a, uh, a resource, the International Association of Medical Assistance to Travelers, that can be helpful if you needed to figure out if there is a, a, 
emergency service area somewhere. So like if you were in the United States, you would just go to the local emergency room, they would call the OB on call and they would kind of care for you. Outside the United States, you might wanna make a plan for that. So if you're planning travel outside the United States, then you can you you can contact um, the IAMAT and figure out a plan uh, um, if should you need it. Uh, the embassies are also a good resource as well. So in terms of vaccinations, um, the flu vaccine is recommended in pregnancy. Um, we do recommend people make sure they get the flu vaccine prior to getting pregnant and um, while they're pregnant. So uh, pregnant women are part of that group of uh, people that have increased risk to develop more serious reactions to the uh, flu infection. Um, the flu vaccine can help reduce the illness if contracting or even prevent contracting it. The other uh, vaccination that's recommended is the Tdap, the tetanus therius pertussis vaccine. And typically you would have been vaccinated when you were a child, and, um, and but it's recommended that we are getting uh, a booster again um, that is offered to all pregnant women in the third trimester. Um, this is to allow for the baby to get some passive immunity, some immunity from you. Um, and uh, is recommended that uh, we do this with each and every pregnancy um, because the baby can't get vaccinated until later in their life. So in addition, it is recommended that all adults who are will be around the baby also get a Tdap vaccine, which could be offered by their primary care or in some pharmacies. Vaccinations you don't really need to have unless you're considered uh, seriously at high risk or hepatitis A, B, and pneumococcal, this would need to be a discussion with your physician. Um, you wanna avoid any live or attenuated vaccines, including varicella, which is the chickenpox, measles, mumps, rubella. The tuberculin skin test is a test to check if you have been um, exposed to tuberculosis and some uh, occupations may require this and this is okay and safe to do so. This slide just includes the Neoga delivery rates. Uh, so most of our delivery rates are by vaginal deliveries. We do have a smaller proportion in which um, women require surgeries. Uh, typically, it's usually based on um, the, how the baby lies that we may uh, schedule a baby for a cesarean section or if we need to kind of get the baby out quickly. Hopefully everybody has this information in terms of how to contact us. Um, uh, this is, I just have some information here. At the top, I do ha include a link to um, general prenatal information. So in addition to the slideshow, there is a packet of information that you can review um, that has uh, a lot of information, a lot of useful information. So in terms of contacting us, you can either call us um, during office hours, which is between 8.30 and 5, you can call 617-731-3400. If it's a non-urgent question, you press option 2 to speak with a nurse. If it is an emergency, then you would press option 1 to speak with a nurse. Um, just gets you through the line quickly. Um, you should get a, you should, uh, a nurse should pick up when you call. It is a live call system. If we have a lot of people calling in, then you might need to kind of stay on hold for a little bit. Um, you can also have the option to leave a message and a nurse can call you back. And if you have some non-urgent questions that you'd rather just kind of message and speak with a nurse, um, you can just go to the gate, a patient gateway and send us a message. You know, if there's anything that the nurses need to review with their doctor, they'll review with the doctor first before getting back to you. If you were to have an emergency after hours on the weekends, we do have a nurse on call to answer those emergencies. We do ask that you restrict those uh, calling to the at those times for emergencies only. Um, so if you're having any bleeding or persistent abdominal pain, we actually use this, uh, this call, uh, this you'd call it this time too if you were in labor or having contractions so that we can review that as well. And this is the end of my uh, slideshow. I encourage you to reach out to us if you have any additional questions about anything that I've reviewed in this slideshow. Um, and we will see you at your next visit.